you know, one one kind of funny thing that I had was a funny thought I had was preparing this episode was that I realized that I keep saying when I, you know, invite guests and that kind of stuff that meta science is one of my main topics of the podcast. But in a way, that's not actually true. Um, it was kind of only once I started, like, you know, preparing this episode that I realized, like, most of the, you know, that meta science itself has a very specific term, i.e., doing science about science. But what I actually always refer to is just the stuff around science in a way, like, you know, how, what it's like to be a journal editor and that kind of stuff. So, I'm kind of looking forward to actually having my first meta science conversation on the podcast, even though I've been saying I've been having them for, for, for years now. Um, and I thought, yeah, maybe if we could actually start like very broadly and kind of traditionally by just defining the term, just so we have like a slightly better grasp on it, um, for the rest of the conversation. Uh, yeah. How, how would you define meta science? Yeah, so meta science, which is sometimes called meta research, so I might use say meta research instead of meta science occasionally. So meta science is a, a field that uses scientific methods to study science itself, and it has several goals: trying to describe science and what scientists do, but also to evaluate science, and also try to try and improve science. And to some extent. Meta science is a new field, and to some extent, it's a very old field. Um, if you imagine a sort of Venn diagram of different scientific disciplines that all have pretty kind of porous boundaries, and researchers move between them to some extent, meta research or meta science is kind of an umbrella that covers many long-standing disciplines like psychology and history of philosophy of science, economics, evidence-based medicine science and metrics, science and technology studies, these all fall under that kind of umbrella of, of meta science. But it also occupies an empty space of that Venn diagram, at least the way we've been talking about it in the last decade or so, where I think there's been a dramatic rise in meta science and, and the, the real beginning of the use of that term prominently in discourse. And that empty space that I think is somewhat novel about the last decade of meta science is that it's much more empirically focused and, and systematic than than previous efforts to describe science, and it's also much more it has a much greater applied focus or translational focus. So a lot of people who are involved in meta science um, currently actually want to change the way that science happens. So they're not just sitting back and observing what scientists are doing; they are themselves often actually scientists and want to improve what they perceive to be problems in the scientific ecosystem. So that's kind of um, a definition in a nutshell. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, I just wanted to use that kind of as a brief, as a kind of a brief intro. I wanted to ask a little bit uh, first how you got into meta science and that kind of stuff. Uh, funnily enough, I think we might have crossed paths before uh, because I did my master's at UCL in 2015. Uh, and I, sp oh, cool. I had most yeah. of my lectures at the at uh, Bedford Way, where I'm assuming you were located. So yeah, but maybe yep. we we actually crossed paths already without realizing it. Um, but I was curious because I saw that you had, you know, always trying to figure out like how people get into things and see if I can like figure it out from publications that kind of stuff. And so you did your PhD in 2016 uh, called Persistence and Plasticity in the human memory system and empirical investigation of the overwriting hypothesis. So very much not meta-analysis from what I can tell. But you also had in 2014 an article in Opticon, which I think is like a UCL thing, right? Something like yeah. that. It's, it's on your Google Scholar, where you attended some sort of symposium in Amsterdam and you and some, some other graduate students summarized it. So maybe yeah, why did why did you attend the symposium um, on improving scientific practice? Yeah, oh, that's that's really cool. We overlapped uh, at UCL. You, you probably walked past me looking very grumpy in the, in the <laughs> corridor because um, I was uh, I was doing my uh, my PhD, um, as you say, on on memory and, and human learning. So within the realms of cognitive psychology, basically. And as I was doing that, I was encountering all kinds of problems that I, I've subsequently realized were, you know, affecting many different scientific disciplines. So a lack of transparency, um, poor use of statistical methods, inadequate research design, 
poor incentives, et cetera, the problems that meta researchers study. I didn't know meta research was a thing um, at the time. I didn't really know open science was a thing. I was on Twitter, and uh, back in the day, Twitter was actually a very nice place to be. There were all these conversations going on about what people often call the replication crisis and related issues. And I was reading about these issues and I was thinking, oh, this is this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing in the lab and in my own work and in my field. And it's, so it's not just me. It's like a broader problem. And to some extent, that was comforting, right? Because, you know, it's, oh, it's not just me. It's not just me who can't replicate these studies. Other people are having those problems as well. To another extent, it's horrifying because yeah. you kind of hope that, you know, particularly in domains like medicine you know, I kind of assumed they knew what they were doing <laughs> and then you hear about these horror stories and these same problems are happening there and you think oh my god this is, this is not good so um I guess yeah there was this creeping realization which got you know louder and louder and louder during my PhD um that there was some serious problems with the way that we do research not just in my domain but in, in many scientific domains and um a, a few of my fellow PhD students shared those worries I'm not sure how we heard about it, but we heard about this uh, symposium in in, uh, in Amsterdam. I think it was called something like Human Factors in Research or something, which is quite interesting because it was... Yeah, dealing with the human factors. Yeah, a group of psychologists, uh, one of whom was uh, Eric Jan Wagenmakers, who I later did a postdoc with. He and his colleagues had uh, organized this symposium to talk about the psychological aspects of this issue. So how we're infected by incentives and various cognitive biases like confirmation bias and how can how that can undermine uh, the quality of research. So uh, yeah, me and uh, I think uh, four of the PhD students in the department um, went to the uh, department admin and we said, you know, is there any funding that could help us go on this like little trip to Amsterdam and, and go to this symposium? Because I don't think really any other, I don't think any members of faculty were particularly interested in this issue. My uh, my supervisor being an exception, uh, David Shanks. But uh, yeah, the department admin was just like, "Oh yeah, sure, uh, we'll give you uh, give you some money for this uh, little road trip." So off we went. Uh, I think say, it's not a it's not a huge trip to Amsterdam. It's not a huge trip, but it felt it felt quite exciting at the time because we'd all felt you know in this in this kind of little bubble where we thought we were kind of the only people worried because no one really in the UCL faculty seemed to be to care about these issues. Um, so we went over there and uh, yeah, it was super exciting. Um, we had all these talks and it was really kind of inspiring. And uh, I think part of the deal with the admin was that we'd we'd write something afterwards to uh, you know justify the, the cost of the trip. And I think it was going to be a blog post or something. But um, yeah, UCL had this kind of uh, sort of internal journal called Opticon something or other. And uh, we ended up writing this little article for them, which kind of summarized the meeting that we'd been to. And it's really funny, like reading reading that back. I think I read it back like a few years ago when I was writing the um, the more recent review of meta research, which we might talk about in a minute. The calibrating the scientific ecosystem with meta research, and many of the themes were still, you know, very relevant. And the the structure was, I think, fit quite well with the uh, the more recent review. So um, yeah, back in those days, I was starting to get interested in, in meta research, even though I didn't know it was it was called that at the time. Yeah, was the I mean, what was it like going to the symposium? I mean, you mentioned kind of before this, the soothing and the, the terror of realizing that this is, you know, you're not the only one with this, with this problem. Did it, uh, I'm just curious because it's, I guess I'm just a few years younger than you that for me, many of the things around meta science became almost standard in those f just very few years in between. So for me, it's kind of, yeah, it would, it, it's almost like not even necessary anymore to go to a conference like that, it feels like. Um, whereas it seems like for you, it was much more like a kind of, what is this? What's going to happen? Uh, so I'm just curious what it was like then going to the symposium. Yeah, that's really funny. Because I think often a lot of us who were around in those early days were these were not mainstream discussions. And in fact, if you were talking about this stuff, you were seen as like, you know, a bit <laughs> odd and... Uh, <laughs> well, like people didn't want to talk about it or it's like uh, a bit yeah, of a nitpick or... um well you, you you may you may have heard some of the language that was thrown around in the early days it was uh really vitriolic people running replication studies were called bullies if you tried to replicate someone's work you're accused of being a bully it very much felt like you're in a very small minority and yeah and i, I guess in a way that's somewhat 
exciting you sort of like pull together with a few people who who share your view on things and now it's kind of funny to think that people are doing research and things like you know sharing data and stuff just seems normal to them i mean that's great i mean that shows how much progress has been made but yeah back in the back in the day particularly being a phd i mean imagine imagine starting your phd in a particular discipline and at the same time, people are saying that like the fundamental assumptions and like the methods that you're being taught in your methods class and the statistics that you that are in that are um, described in the textbooks that you're reading and you're supposed to be learning from are wrong. That's crazy. It's like someone's pulling the rug from under you when you step in the building, and really difficult, I think, psychologically as well to to, to deal with. And unfortunately, a lot of I think a lot of um, PhD students have left because of that kind of thing. Like they, they were struggling to to replicate, you know, these big papers in their field, these big studies reported in supposedly the best journals, and they thought there was something wrong with them. And you know, other people thought there was something wrong with them because they couldn't get those same results. Turns out, in many cases, it probably wasn't them. It was a problem with those original studies. But yeah, quite a quite a difficult time. In a way, an exciting time because, yeah, like that um, that particular meeting that we went to was pretty exciting to see that there were people who were trying to do something about it. That was quite exciting. Mm. And then uh, it's always like uh, looking at people's, uh, particularly in your case because you're at UCL, I like looking at the acknowledgements of PhD thesis to see if like uh, there's any overlap or anything like that because often you find the most interesting things there. Uh, interestingly, I didn't actually know any of the people you, you mentioned there, uh, but I found another sentence that was kind of interesting. Um, and I'd like to hear you elaborate a little bit on it, which was, thank you to Brian Nosek for allowing me to invite myself over to work with him and his team at the Center for Open Science last year. Um, so how did you, how did you invite yourself over to, to work there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I guess I was, I was learning about this world of open science and, I, I guess I knew I knew of Brian through Twitter. Um, he would not have known me. Um, That's great. He's like a social media star. Not, not, not a scientist, <laughs> right. but like a social media star. Yeah. <laughs> well, also a very good scientist. Um, the Center for Open Science was, you know, just starting to gain awareness. And, you know, I was aware of it. And I'd started sharing data on the open science framework and stuff like that. And I think it was the only place I knew in the world that was, you know, where there was a group of people who were working towards fixing science in some way. And uh, as part of my PhD funding, I had, I think it was, I think they gave you like a, a couple of months or something funding to go abroad to, um, I think that their, their view was that you'd go and work in a research lab somewhere. Um, but I was like, oh, I could use this to go to the Center for Open Science. So I think I just emailed Brian out of the blue and um, asked him if I could come and visit. And he said, sure. Then we had to figure out visas and stuff, which was a bit more complicated. But long story short, I ended up going out there to Virginia for, um, I think, a month or so. Yeah, and it was awesome. I mean, the, the Center for Open Science was, like, relatively new back then. So there was, like, a really exciting atmosphere. And it was very different to the university that environment that I was used to it was more like a startup kind of environment it was the first time I lived abroad so that was very kind of exciting as well um, I remember uh, walking back from the center for open science to this house I was staying in one night in uh, Charlottesville which is where they're based and there were like all these like fireflies in the air and it was just really kind of atmospheric and cool and um, I had a really fun time there it was great I, everyone was really friendly um, on my last night there was a, there was a guy there called uh, called Billy Hunt. He was like a, a photographer and developer, super talented guy. He was also a DJ. So uh, and I'm I'm a bit of a DJ in my spare time. So me and him put on a DJ set um, in his photography studio, like round the corner from the Center for Open Science. So we had this kind of party in his uh, in his photography studio, which is pretty cool. So yeah, um, I had a great time there, and I got involved in I guess my first met a research study, um, a study of um, badges, ironically at the journal Psychological Science, which we might talk about later. And yeah, I learned a huge amount there, even just within a few weeks. Yeah, it was a cool time. Did you have a particular plan of what you were going to do there? Like, I'd like to work on this thing, or was it just, hey, there's this whole problem and I just want to learn more about everything? Or Yeah, I had, I had no idea what I was going to do there. 
They had no idea what I was going to do there. <laughs> so I just kind of rocked up and they were a bit like, oh, what do we, what do, we do with this guy? Um, but I, you know, they were super friendly and I just kind of joined all the conversations that were happening. So much going on there. You know, they were talking about the, the open science framework and, you know, what that interface should be like and how to encourage researchers to engage with open practices. I got involved with something called the pre-registration challenge, where basically they'd been given, Center for Open Science had been given, um, I think it was a million dollars to distribute to people to engage with pre-registration. So this is, you know, this is like super early days, like no one in psychology pretty much was pre-registering at all. So they were like, how do we just get people to try this? Because if they try it once, they'll realize it's a good thing. So we were handing out these $1,000 prizes to people if they pre-registered for the first time. So I was helping with that. And um i think you know contributing to a study and yeah it all worked out pretty well in the end <laughs> oh and i also uh one person that took me on a trip to foam henge which is a life-size replica of stonehenge made of foam like styrofoam um super surreal uh and you know i think they i think they thought i would have been to the real stonehenge because i'm from the uk and so you know obviously i must have seen everything in the uk but i was i haven't seen the real one but this is incredible it was uh yeah so you know that was one of my top experiences as well nice i've never heard of foam henge no i know i it sounds like a reason to fly to the US just for that for sure Check um out. okay so you you finish your phd and then was it already clear that, okay, I want to not continue doing kind of standard cognitive psychology, that kind of stuff? Did you apply for, or did you apply for stuff in psychology, standard research? Or, I mean, you ended up, I think it was immediately after then working with John Ioannidis. Uh, yeah, kind of what was your kind of how, how did you make that decision? I mean, also just how many jobs were there in meta science at the time and that kind of stuff? How did you manage that as a late PhD student or postdoc? I got to the towards the end of my PhD, and at, at that point, I'm pretty sure I still didn't know what meta research was, and I was pretty depressed to be honest. I, you know, I'd gone into science thinking it was, you know, all these different scientific ideals like transparency and, to some extent, objectivity, trying to be honest in your work, and trying to trying to find out the truth, you know, like <laughs> rather than just promote yourself. Um, things like that I, I you know I thought that was really what science was like and I'd had four years of finding out that really it wasn't um, obviously there were there were good people um, I was very fortunate to have a great supervisor but I was uh, my field in general I thought this is crazy like e even if I try and do good work in this field it's not gonna make a difference because there's so much crap in the literature and the lack of transparency was just like shocking so you had no idea what was out there. Um, all these like negative null results that you know you just didn't know about. So I got to the end of my PhD. I, I'm not quite sure. I think I I think I was thinking you know I'm probably going to need to leave academia, even though I kind of still loved it. I was still interested in the questions of my PhD thesis in memory, and I was still liked doing experiments and etc. And then the way I ended up getting into meta research was really serendipity there was an organization called bits um the berkeley institute for transparency in the social sciences obviously based at berkeley university university of berkeley in california and they had this uh small grants scheme i think they'd basically been given a pot of money by the the arnold foundation who also funded the yeah. center for open science and also funded metrics um which we'll probably talk about in a minute and uh, so they had this pot of money to give out these like, small grants. And um, so I was reading about that. And I had this idea to build a platform for a community living meta-analysis. So one thing I was frustrated with is that, you know, you'd read a review of a particular area and it was already outdated by several years. So my idea was, well, what if we did this online and every time a new study was published that was relevant to the meta-analysis, you fed that in. Um, and it automatically updated all the graphs, et cetera. And you could also put various, you know, other diagnostic graphs on there, like for publication bias and that kind of thing. So I had this idea for that and uh, applied for one of these grants. And I got an email back saying, your application's been rejected. However, somebody else put in an application that was very similar to yours. Do you want us to put you in touch with this person? So I was like, okay, I guess. Like, I don't really know what, what we're going to do with that, but okay. 
Uh, this person turned out to be uh, Mike Frank, who is a developmental psychologist at Stanford University. And so I exchanged a few emails with him about this idea. And that didn't end up really going anywhere. But he was like, oh, have you heard about this postdoc opportunity at Stanford in this group called Metrics? And Metrics is a group that does meta research um, at the time, possibly the only group or one of the only groups in the world that was doing meta research, certainly one of the first ones. So that's the first time I think I came across this term of meta research. And I read about this postdoc position. It was my birthday, and the deadline was the day after my birthday. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> this is not great timing. And also, I've never done any meta research, so why would they ever employ me? And I had a conversation with my supervisor about it, and he said, well, I'm pretty sure you can kind of, you know, frame what you've done. Like, so you've done some replications. Maybe they consider that to be meta research. Just, you know, just have a shot. I was on the cusp of not applying, um, and I just thought, oh, to hell with it, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at this, and I did, and ended up getting this postdoc position and, and going over to uh, Stanford for a couple of years to work in, in meta-research, and that's everything started there, really, <laughs> for the meta-research side of things. Okay, so you, you just casually got the only position in meta-research <laughs> available in the world. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's the only one, but um, but I mean, yeah, if, yeah, yeah but if very, it's the, one of the main labs doing it, then there can't have been that many. Few. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought we could we could start kind of talking about the actual meta research you've done. We could use some examples of that you've worked on as an example of you know, in part, this for this, this kind of process of meta science and how it works and how it kind of fits into the whole ecosystem. Um, yeah, so maybe as an example, kind of, of, of meta science and how it, yeah, how the results can directly influence kind of how science is done. You have an article on post publication critique in journals, something I've also talked about a little bit, I think, with Simin Razia. I think we talked a little bit about that. So just maybe to begin with, what is post publication critique in journals? And uh, what did you do? Or what did you find first in, in that paper? Well, post-publication critique generally is just the idea that after a scientific paper has been published, is there any kind of critical discourse about that paper in the scientific community? And that, of course, can take place in in all kinds of places. It takes place on social media. Uh, it takes place in journal clubs, conferences in the Q&A session. It takes place in the corridor when you're chatting with your neighbor about you know a recent paper. But most formally, it takes place at scientific journals. Um, so the study we did was looking at post-publication critiques, specifically at scientific journals. And we had a very kind of wordy operational definition of what we meant by post-publication critique in this particular study. But I will save your listeners that and just say, you know, the, the prototypical example of what I mean here is a letter to the editor. So... Um, if you see a paper published and you say, hey, there's, a, there's an error in their analysis or they, you know, they, if they tried this alternative analysis, they would have got different results or I disagree with the interpretation, etc. Um, how do you kind of submit that idea to the journal and get it published alongside the original paper so that other people are aware of it? Um, and of course, the, there are various advantages to doing that. There's advantages in terms of the fact that that could then become part of the scientific record, whereas by contrast, discussions on social media are transient and kind of ephemeral and aren't part of the scientific record. And there's also some element of there being more incentive to do that kind of critique because you get, you know, potentially you get a publication out of it. Um, so um, there are many reasons to think why, you know, post-publication critique at journals is, is especially interesting. Uh, yeah, so we decided to do a study about that. There's, of course, lots of anecdotal evidence of people struggling to get their critiques published in journals. You hear lots on uh, lots on social media, but also um, on the Retraction Watch blog. There's plenty of examples of people who've spotted a serious error in a scientific paper, and they've not been able to convince the journal to publish a critique about it. And that paper is essentially just left there without this issue being identified and, you know, new readers will come to that paper and not be aware of that issue. And that, that seems problematic. Yeah, so I, partly motivated by those anecdotal examples, I wanted to do a study of, you know, what are journals' formal policies about post-publication critique? You know, first and foremost, do they even 
accept it? Do they have a letter to the editor or similar format that you can actually submit your critiques to the journal through? Um, and then if they do, do they impose any kind of limits on those critiques? The primary ones being, do they impose length limits? Um, and do they impose time limits? So they might say, we'll only accept post-publication critique within three months of the original article being published, for example. And time limits, I think, are particularly interesting because I don't see a good justification for them. Like, I'm not quite sure why we think sci- the, you know, the scientific conversation about this paper would end within three months or why if you found an error in a paper from 20 years ago that it's not, you know, you shouldn't point that out. Yeah, I was going to ask about that just briefly. There is, is there, I mean, what do, do the journals provide? A, has anyone provided a reason for why there should be this time limit? Is it just so like you don't get, you know, tons and tons of letters to the editor like if you have an old journal that's been around for like 80 years you don't just get like you know bombarded with letters of minor errors that happened 80 years ago or uh well maybe but um i don't think you know you don't see journals that don't have these time limits being bombarded with uh letters to the editor about articles from 80 years ago so uh, I, don't, I think it's like it's it's a problem in theory but not really in practice I think the journal's motivation is that they want to promote what they would call timely discourse. Like they, they want to be, you know, have their journal be more about the latest articles. But um, frankly, I think that in a lot of cases, they just simply don't want errors to be pointed out in their published work because it damages the journal's brand. So uh, I, do, I do not know that for certain, but I suspect that's a, uh, playing into this a lot. Yeah, so uh, so, in this, so this was a pretty descriptive study. We also wanted to compare across different scientific disciplines how the journals in those fields uh, were handling post-publication critique. So we uh, we basically looked across science, uh, science divided into 22 different scientific disciplines. And in each of those domains, we took the top 15 journals as ranked by impact factor. So that's not a perfect um, measure of anything really, but it's a a good indicator of journal prominence. Um, So 15 prominent journals, very prominent journals in each of these disciplines, disciplines like uh, medicine and psychology and psychiatry and economics. And we uh, went to those journals' websites and we looked to see whether there was a way of submitting post-publication critique. And if so, like what format was that? So sometimes it might be a letter to the editor, which is a, a formal publication, but usually quite a short one. Sometimes it was a commentary, which is a more kind of extensive form of um, critique. And sometimes it was just kind of like online comments function where you could kind of, you know, tap something into a box, a few sentences, and it'd be published kind of immediately. Um, And then we also extracted whether uh, information about whether there were uh, length limits, time to submit limits, and various other details like peer review and how that was handled, things like that. And the sort of headline finding is that uh, I think, yeah, about just over a third of these top journals did not have any way of submitting post-publication critique to them. And then of the journals that did offer a form of post-publication critique, many imposed limits in terms of time to submit and length. And some of those limits were really strict. Uh, So I think the most restrictive word limit we encountered was 175 words. I don't know if you ever tried saying anything in 175 words, but It's not easy to say anything substantive or evidence-based or even particularly useful. And then the strictest time limit was two weeks. So imagine (laughs) seeing an article that's been published and thinking, I have just two weeks to write this critique. And then after that time, this paper is immune to criticism. Uh, That seems crazy to me. So uh, yeah, so I, I think that study exposed some weaknesses in the way that Journals are handling post-publication critique, and we offer a few suggestions about how they could um, improve that situation. Although I don't think journal policy is the only issue here. I think there's a lot of kind of cultural issues as well about how scientists critique each other and understand how to accept critique as well. So that's mm-hmm. a deeper issue. Uh, the, the, the most important question I wrote down is, if I understand it correctly, there was one journal with a 10,000 word limit for the critique. <laughs> I mean, which journal was that? Because that's longer than most of my articles I think I've ever written. 
Oh yeah, that was um, that was definitely an outlier, and I have no idea really why. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know maybe they just didn't want to limit it, but they didn't want to literally make it unlimited. One one thing I found kind of interesting was the difference between disciplines. Um, so if I remember correctly, there are some disciplines, I think like medicine or something like that, where pretty much a hundred percent of the journals you, you surveyed uh, offer some form of uh, post publication critique. But other areas, I think, like mathematics, it's very uncommon for a journal to do that. So I'm just curious, I mean, almost just why there's these big differences in journals, uh, in areas, and maybe also whether that's, I'm just curious whether that actually says anything important, or they just ha have different ways of doing it. So it just, you know, it looks the kind of findings you have look kind of like bigger differences than they are in practice, if that makes sense. I think there are many different factors that could be at play here um, into why particular disciplines have more or less uh, post-publication critique. And our study did not investigate those, so I do not know for sure um, what those factors are and the extent to which they're involved. But speculating, I would think that in mathematics, for example, you know, that's quite a different kind of paper that's going to get published in mathematics um, versus medicine or psychology, for example. And the way that they respond to each other's work will often be like a paper response to a paper. Um, it won't necessarily need to be a small, a smaller kind of critique of a error in a particular study. And another factor is that more of a kind of the extent to which that research has more kind of uh, imminent applied consequences. So in medicine, if there is a error in a study, like a clinical trial that's informing clinicians about how they treat patients, it is extremely important that that gets flagged as soon as possible and, you know, shown prominently next to that article. You know, it's, it's less important in the, um, the less applied disciplines that such errors are, are flagged. So there's Presumably, much more. There's been much more momentum historically in medicine for allowing this kind of thing to happen. You know, having said that, uh, although we found that in the medical journals they were much more likely to allow post-publication critique in some form, they also had the strictest limits on critique. I think that example I gave you for of the two-week time period comes from the Lancet, one of the biggest medical journals. So there's still, uh, you know, issues there. But yeah, there are many factors involved, I think, in these different uh, differences between the disciplines. Yeah, it's so weird. This, like, I mean, do you have any idea of why they make the time limits so restrictive? Because it, I mean, in part, it just seems to me, if I want to be cynical, it seems like it's a way to pretend you're offering it without actually offering it. I don't know, maybe for The Lancet, it's a little bit different because it's so, I imagine... Uh, in medicine, it's so prominent that people might actually, you know, read the articles pretty soon after they appear. But two weeks is still like, I mean, people have stuff to do, right? I mean, I guess it's, uh, oh, sorry, was the Lancet only the word limit, not the time limit? The Lancet was the uh, the time limit, but it also had a tight uh, okay. word limit, I think, of 200 words. So it's, yeah. it's pretty bad here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, do you know why they do the, I mean, it's... Yeah, uh, part of it, part of it as well, might be a bit of a holdover from the print era, uh, where journals were predominantly in print and not online, and they would have wanted to publish any such critiques in the same issue as the original paper. Um, so they would have wanted to have have had them, you know, very quickly. So some of it's maybe a bit of a hangover from that. And it, you know, in general, I think a lot of journal policy that you see is basically stuff that was brought in at some point. And everyone's kind of forgotten about and no one's really actively thought, oh, we need to update that or change that or this is not optimal. It's often also not entirely clear who is responsible. Um, it's not always the editor in chief who can change those policies. Sometimes it's uh, some kind of publication board or the publisher. And often nobody really seems to know who has the power to change those things. Um, so they just sit there unchanged for a long time, even if they're suboptimal. And the hope is, the hope of doing this kind of meta research is that the people who do have the power to change those things see it and realize it's a problem and they do actually change it. 
And there is a bit of a gap here. There's a gap between the research and the policy because and it's not entirely clear how you fill that. So, you know, once we published that study, it wasn't entirely clear how do we communicate that to the people who need to hear about it. And, you know, to some extent, you could, you know, maybe we could do a survey of all of these editors and like let them know about the study and what they think about it, et cetera, maybe, but, you know, many of them are very busy people and they often don't respond to, to surveys. So um, there is an important gap there. And sometimes you're lucky and you do get a good response to your matter of research, but um, often there's just a kind of silence and you think, oh, have I just published another paper that no one's really listened to? <laughs> um, the answer's yeah. always That's yes. something I... Yeah, that's something I try to think of more is like, how do we, when we're planning studies like that, how do we also make a plan for disseminating that to the people who need to hear it most? And there's various ideas about how you can do that more effectively, like, you know, having some kind of data dashboard or something that you can refer to people to so that the results are a bit more kind of accessible and um, things like that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think about where, uh, like one question I had I was thinking about post application critique is like whether it even makes sense to have it as part of the actual journal, like the original journal that published the original findings. I mean, do you think that that is the best way to do it or is, you know, maybe some sort of external and independent place like pub here, maybe, um, but something like that, do you think that's maybe a better approach than, you know, because the journal is always, as you, you know, they don't want to publish maybe too many negative things because I think it makes them look bad and that kind of stuff, whereas some sort of independent platform just doesn't suffer from at least some of those problems. So I, I definitely hesitate to say that journals are the best place for this kind of thing to happen. And I think a, you know, a plethora of different places where this stuff can happen, post-publication critique can happen, is probably a good thing. There are, you know, advantages and disadvantages to these different things, though. So, you know, as I said before, social media instant access you know you can you can put your critique on there immediately but it depends on how many followers you have you know the extent to which people are going to hear about that and it's ephemeral it doesn't it's not part of the scientific record so when people read the relevant paper they don't necessarily not necessarily aware of your criticism pub peer uh is a you know much more structured than that but again if people go to the original paper are they aware of the um any relevant comments on pub peer i think you can get a plugin for pub peer which will alert you to such comments but you know has everyone installed that plugin no um also i doesn't guess work that hardly great. anyone has i don't okay <laughs> i mean i, I installed <laughs> so, it after i talked to elizabeth big um because she recommended it and it it seems like whenever a paper is mentioned somewhere on a web page it tells you critique so like if you have sometimes i'll have i'll be like on once i was like on a on a podcast website and they had they referenced some paper somewhere along the episodes and it said like there's a comment here it's like yeah so sometimes or sometimes they will uh, I, I had it that it says like there's comments for this paper and but there were comments for like two other papers that that paper cited or something like that it was a bit weird so yeah it's, it's not mm. it's not optimal yeah so I, th I think things like pub peer are great um i mean there was also the the case of uh pubmed commons i don't know if you heard of that it was an effort by PubMed to introduce something very similar to PubPeer, basically a um, community commenting platform. And they ultimately decided to shut down because they weren't getting enough comments. So I think an important issue here is incentives, like what incentive pe do people have to actually submit a critique to make their critique known? And there are some people like Elizabeth Bick who are doing tremendous work and publishing their critiques on PubPeer but a lot of researchers don't do that um, as their kind of, you know, full-time focus. And if anything, they're just going to be disincentivized to, to, to publish a critique, even if they have one, because they potentially, you know, fear repercussions from the original authors. So they need some kind of carrot, I think, to do it. And the one carrot that journals can offer is a publication in the journal, right? Uh, whether we like it or not, publications are de facto currency in the kind of scientific ecosystem. So that is potentially one way to leverage journals to increase public post-publication critique. I mean, I think this does expose a deeper problem about incentive structures in science. And, you know, we shouldn't need that. We shouldn't need that carrot to, to do critique of each other's work. That should just be part of the job. However, you know, being realistic, uh, at least in the short term, I think leveraging journals to encourage post-publication critique is probably a good idea. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the effect that meta science can have. Um, I mean, I think the post publication critique paper is pretty recent, if I remember. But you mentioned uh, before we started recording that, for example, um, some of the work you've done on open data uh, has actually led some policy to some policy changes in the journal. Um, also, I think Brian Nosek, when I talked to him, he mentioned that one of your maybe it was this one, I can't remember, but that it had, I think it was for pre registration or register reports. I think it was register reports that it like f laid open some problems that could then be addressed on OSF. Uh, yeah, I was just hoping you could maybe comment a little bit on kind of what what you found uh, for the open data and kind of how the journal then uh, addressed um, what you found. Yeah, sure. So those are um, those are two different studies. Uh, yeah. So maybe I'll briefly talk about the registered reports one first. At the time, registered reports were pretty new and they'd only been adopted by a few journals. And uh, we thought this is a really good time to do a pretty descriptive study, just looking at you know how many registered reports are there out there. I think we were thinking of doing something more extensive, like you know looking at the content of those registered reports and examining various aspects of them. But the first stage of that was simply to identify how many registered reports are there and how many journals are publishing them. And we ran into all kinds of problems uh, doing that. So the kind of headline finding of that study is that at the time, most registered reports were not registered. Um, they were not publicly available as the stage one registered report. That isn't actually as bad as it sounds, because I think at the time, you know, there was a pretty small community working on this. And basically what happened was that most registered reports were simply being handled in-house by the journals. So the stage one manuscripts, they were still being assessed by the journals at stage one. And there was a, um, you know, a document at the journal, which was the stage one manuscript. However, it wasn't publicly available. So that's not ideal in the long term because the research community can't verify and check these things. It kind of relies on a small group of people at journals to do that. So we, uh, yeah, so we ended up turning this into a, a study and looked at how often this is happening. We found problems with uh, the fact that many registered reports didn't even identify themselves properly as a registered report. There was poor metadata, so it was quite difficult to do meta research on these things. And yeah, I think I was, I think I remember being a little bit worried actually just before we published that because, you know, it was, it was, I, I was um, super excited about, and still am super excited about registered reports. I think they're a great idea in theory. And yet we'd found these problems with the implementation. And, you know, I spent a long time thinking about how we deliver that message, which is, you know, somewhat nuanced. Um, you know, we're not bashing the theoretical concept. We're just saying there's some kind of implementation problems here. But it turned out to be, just like a really nice thing. So we, you know, we published the paper and very quickly a commentary was published by uh, Chris Chambers, um, who I think you've had on the podcast. He's yep. one of the pioneers of the registered reports format. Um, and David Meller, who is at the Center for Open Science. And that, those two are, you know, prominent people in the re uh, registered reports kind of world and they coordinate policy for registered reports. Uh, I remember hearing that they'd, uh, you know, written a commentary. And often, if someone writes a commentary on your paper, it's it's often a negative thing. And you're thinking, oh God, <laughs> but um, you know, read their commentary, and I was just like, oh, you know, such a relief. And uh, they they were like, oh, this is great. Like, thank you for doing research on this thing. And you know, it's really cool to hear. Uh, not really cool to hear there are problems. No one wants to hear there are problems. But it's great that the research was done, and that we now know about these problems. And um, here's what we're going to do to correct it. And in fact, we've already started and here are the results of that. So they, they were reaching out to journal editors and making them aware of the problem. They created a central registry um, so that journals would use that instead of keeping everything internal. And this all happened really rapidly. I um, can't remember exactly, but within a few months or something. So that was a, a very encouraging example of how meta research can have, can lead to changes um, in the scientific ecosystem. So I like, I like that example. So one thing that happened between me asking you to come on the podcast and us now actually talking is that, well, first, Zameen Vazir was uh, named as 
well, now already the new editor of uh, Psych Science. And secondly, you were named, you had a kind of special kind of role, I feel like, uh, with the title of Senior Editor for Statistics, Transparency and Rigor at, yeah, at Psychological Science, obviously. You have kind of this like slightly separate position uh, in the whole editorial board. Um, so I'm curious, uh, I mean, I guess you've, we're recording this on the 11th of January. So I guess you've been officially working in this as part of this for 10 days now. Yeah. What, what, what exactly does that role entail? Uh, yeah. Maybe that's just a question. Yeah. So, um, super exciting, of course, that Samin's now the editor in chief of psychological science. And as part of that, she wanted to improve, um, how the journal handles various issues related to statistics, transparency, rigor and ethics um ethics is not included in my title because then the acronym acronym would have been stare instead of star <laughs> which would have been upsetting i think um Who's the staring editor here <laughs> so uh yeah so the the team that i'll be leading basically our remit is to provide specialized assistance on anything that fits under that umbrella and uh, part of that activity is going to be doing routine checks on mainly transparency. So um, has the data being shared, et cetera? Is the study pre-registered? Things like that. And uh, another aspect of the team is to be available to give ad hoc advice to um, the editors who are handling papers. So if they encounter um, you know, a statistical model that they're, they don't know much about, then they can put out the bat signal, if you like, um, to the star team, and then someone from our team will help them. And that might just be kind of giving them some informal advice about a particular specific question, or it might be providing a full-blown specialized review of that particular issue. That's a, that's a problem. And part of the inspiration for that actually comes from... Uh, so one thing I'm, I'm pretty keen on is identifying things that are done in some fields that seem to help improve rigor, quality, et cetera, that aren't being used in others. And when I was in the metrics group, most of them work in medicine, not in psychology. And it's actually very common in medicine for journals to have dedicated statistical reviewers or editors. And we did a survey of that. We did a comparative survey in psychology and found that most psychology journals don't have this. So now we have this opportunity to actually put it into practice. Um, so I'm really excited. We have this uh, great team put together to yeah help like address all of these issues yeah that's it in a nutshell mm -hmm. yeah i think it's uh, it's really cool and interesting because i mean you know i'm, I'm i just well i just finished my phd but i you know have fairly limited experience with peer review and that kind of stuff and one thing i always find slightly weird is that for example i have no evidence that anyone ever read any of my pre-registrations even though i've pre-registered like several you know for, for each of the paper you most of them I has pre-registrations and you know sometimes because sometimes you have like slight deviations from them or something like that and you think like oh how are they, they going to react to that but no one's ever commented on anything in the pre-registrations in general it feels like a lot of the kind of open science things or like reproducibility the some of the new tools you use are actually not being addressed during peer review and it's kind of cool that it seems like psych science now is taking a bit of a stand to try and actually do a little bit more about that yeah one thing i had a question about and this is kind of um, a fairly generic question but one that i want you might have thought about a bit more than most people given that this is now your you'll be working as part of this is that what do you do about different data formats and programming languages and these kind of things because i've submitted papers and then people said like oh thanks for the data but i don't use matlab so i can't use it so now, you know, I always then upload it as a, the data as a CSV file also, but obviously all my code is written in MATLAB and that kind of stuff. So I'm just curious kind of what your thoughts are on that, because especially something like psych science, you must get submissions with all sorts of data formats and programming languages uh, and that kind of stuff. So I'm just, yeah, is that just kind of an, a problem of the field and you just solve it by having expertise in your team of the different approaches that people might have or kind of how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a great question. So currently, I don't know what variety of different 
formats were going to receive because sharing of analysis code was not previously a requirement at psychological science. So we that's a requirement that we've just brought in. Um, so I'm yet to see what we'll get. But um, as you say, I expect there is going to be uh, at least some variety there. We're going to see some MATLAB scripts. We're going to see some Python. We're going to see some R. We're going to see some SPSS syntax, uh, JASP modules, etc. All kinds of things. And yeah, it's difficult. We, uh, I mean, essentially the way we're going to handle that is to strongly encourage authors to at least use open formats where possible. Um, so sharing data in a CSV file, um, for example, um, that means that it's maximally interoperable with other software programs. Uh, in other words, other software programs can read um, the CSV file, whereas they wouldn't be able to read a MATLAB file, for example, necessarily. So the, the, uh, the more that researchers can do that, the better. However, I think we do need to be flexible to some extent. And, you know, authors um, uh, will need to use the tools that, you know, they have access to themselves and that they've got training on, etc. We can't just expect everybody to use, you know, the pipeline that I prefer, for example, um, which would make my life easier. But, you know, that's just not feasible. So, yes, um, essentially, we need to have a team with diverse skills and access to different um, software program, pro, uh, programs so we can handle that uh, in the event that we don't uh, we'll probably you know need to call upon the community to find you know recruit ad hoc uh, star team members uh, to come in and uh, uh, help us with those particular cases yeah yeah and I'm just curious whether you have any advice because I guess my problem is a little bit that I work kind of in Part of the, some of the review, like it seems like because it's quite interdisciplinary, some people come from like social psychology and they don't know how to program and have never used GitHub. And some people are, you know, almost hardcore computational neuroscientists. So like, I mean, I've, I've literally submitted, I've gotten review comments where someone said like, you know, we already uploaded a CSV so they, you know, could access it. And then they said, oh, I can't, don't know how to download a CSV from GitHub. I couldn't do it. And. It feels like to me that, you know, it feels a little bit like one of those situations where, I mean, you just obviously usually can't please everyone, but it feels like no matter what you do, you're going to get criticized from one or the other direction. Do, do you just have any, from experience, any advice there of like how people in this kind of situation should do it? Um, I mean, the, there are obviously, you know, particular tools that you can use. And if you're in the position where you can learn new tools like if you're you know particularly if you're at the beginning of your career and you're um you still have some kind of choice in the matter then any kind of open tool is generally going to be better for this kind of thing than a closed tool so r would be better than matlab for example because it's much more accessible to many more people but you know in general to some extent you know probably stuck with what you you already have had training on if you don't have the time to learn something new and in that case, I think the best you can do is to provide very good documentation. And currently, at least in the meta research studies I've done, you find that although people may be willing to share data and code, it's often not very well documented. And I think that's not, uh, you know, often the problem there is that they just don't know what information someone else would need to rerun that code or understand that data because they've never been in that person's shoes. They've always been in the shoes of the person writing the code in the first place, not in the person who's trying to interpret it afterwards. So one thing I've been really keen on is trying to incorporate good practices for writing reproducible papers into the student curriculum. And we did this a little bit, uh, did this with uh, Mike Frank at Stanford with one of the graduate courses there. And one of the exercises we'd get students to do is to try and reproduce the analysis in a published paper um, and to, you know, experience it from that perspective, they then appreciate how difficult it is. And then when they write their own analyses, they can put themselves in those shoes and be like, oh, okay, I need to tell the person, you know, this is how to set up the working directory. This is how to provide a good code book so they can figure out what my data means, etc. cetera. Um, so a lot of it is about, yeah, taking on that other perspective and, one thing we're advising um, through psychological science is that before you submit your paper to the journal, have one other person in your team or maybe even an independent person try and reproduce the results. So just give it to a colleague and say, can you reproduce this? And I think in the vast majority of cases, they're going to find all kinds of issues, probably minor issues, 
um, and they'll send you this list and say, look, I couldn't figure out what you meant here. Or, the, you know, just like when you get feedback on your written manuscript and people say, I have no idea what you're talking about in this sentence. And you're like, nope, it's perfectly clear. I wrote it. I know, I know what I'm doing. But an outsider, you know, isn't in your head. Uh, and so there's all these assumptions that you made that they don't have. And it's the same thing for reproducibility. So, yeah, if you just have one other person who didn't write the code and didn't, you know, create the original data file, take a look at it. That will often expose lots of the uh, the problems um, and help you to kind of fix those, yeah. At the end of each interview, I asked three recurring questions, the same three recurring questions. Uh, the first question is, what's a book or paper you think more people should read? Uh, this can be famous or completely unknown, new or completely old, just something you think people should read more. I did have a really nice example, and I told a friend of mine, and she told me it was too pretentious. So <laughs> I've changed. Wait. I've changed my suggestion. Wait, I want to get wait, uh, <laughs> too pretentious scientifically, or I don't know. It's quite. It was quite an old thing. Anyway, okay, I'm going to give you a better one. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to recommend a book called Science Fictions, um, which is by Stuart Ritchie, and I think it's probably the best introduction to this topic of meta research and problems with the quality of scientific research. It's a very accessible book. It's written with a lot of kind of interesting case studies from lots of different disciplines. So like some from psychology, some from medicine, some from other places. And it's really well written. It's very engaging and uh, yeah, a great introduction uh, to this topic. Um, I also listened to it as an audio book. So if you do that, you get the advantages of Stuart's very soothing Scottish accent. Um, so I'd recommend that. Uh, yeah, that's my recommendation yeah. for a book. And if you want to hear more of that soothing accent, I did an entire episode with Stuart in large part about that book also. So yeah, it's funny. I th I'm just trying to, I have a keep a brief list of like what people said before. And I think this is now the second time I've I'm always proud if I've read something that people recommend. I think this is the second time that it's happened. The second question is uh, something you wish you'd learned sooner. Uh, this can be from your private work life, whatever you want. Just something you think that if you'd learned that sooner, your your life might have, you know, been a, a little bit nicer. Uh, so one thing I really wish I'd learned sooner is that I really, really like podcasts, um, <laughs> and I didn't I didn't realize this until the pandemic started. And I was, you know, taking long walks to get out of the house and get some exercise. And, you know, that was really kind of boring. And then I, I think I think I started with audiobooks actually and then transitioned into to podcasts. But now I listen to them like almost all the time. Um uh they're just they're like magic. So, you know, you'll be doing all these boring chores around the house or like shopping for groceries or whatever. And then you've just got like all of this interesting stuff going on in your head at the same time. What an incredible invention! I I can't ima I can't imagine like looking back what I was doing with my life when I wasn't listening to podcasts all the time. Um, so that for me is a a huge thing that I I wish I'd learned sooner in my life. <laughs> yeah. You can get rid of the terror of being on by yourself with your own thoughts. Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes I wonder whether... Actually, have you found that um, sometimes I feel like if I listen too much to podcasts, it, you know, you you need those moments of just, like, being alone with your thoughts and not thinking about anything and just doing something mundane for half an hour. Uh, I don't know whether you've reached that level of listening to podcasts, but I've actually somehow stopped listening a lot less to podcasts because, yeah, I find sometimes it can... It's just a lot of talking going on. Maybe I'm just not used to that. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, yeah. No, I'm, I, I haven't had that problem. I'm, I'm obsessed with them. Um, and I don't need to listen to my own internal monologue. I much prefer listening to other people okay. saying interesting things <laughs> <enough>. myself. <laughs> Maybe that's why I started a podcast. So I can kind of do, but you know, have podcasts, but also my, I, mean, I don't listen to my own ones. That would be slightly psychopathic. Um, do you have any recommendations? Any ones you've been listening to recently a lot that you think people should check out? Well, I, I hope you don't take it personally, but I don't listen to a lot of science podcasts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that every day. So I, I think uh, I need a bit of a break from it. Uh, I listen to lots of, you know, news post podcasts, but that's probably quite boring. 
I have a favorite comedy podcast called Three Bean Salad, which, you know, it's probably just depends on what kind of humor you're into, but it's just actually just three blokes having a chat. And I really like this podcast called uh, Song Exploder, where they basically take a particular song and they invite the artist who created the song to come on the show and break down exactly what their thought process was as they were creating that song. And they often interleave it with like different parts of the song. So they'll start off with like, you know, just playing the bass line and then they'll talk you through why they decided to do it that way. And then they'll add in the drums and slowly like over the episode, the song builds up and is created into its uh, final version, which you hear like right at the end. Um, hmm. So that's, that's one of my favorite podcasts. I love it. Okay. Great. I might check them out then. Although, as I said, I don't listen to that many anymore. Uh, I guess I do enough of them right now. Maybe it's like you with science. Um, anyway, uh, final question is advice for PhD students and postdocs. And actually, I thought I'd just shift in another kind of related question here just briefly. Uh, because a few weeks ago, I was talking to someone who said, I think his girlfriend was just finishing a PhD and wanted to do something like meta science. And he said she was really struggling to find like positions she could apply for. And she said she talked to postdocs in the field and they also were struggling to find positions. Um, I was really surprised by that. I'm just curious, like, is that, I always thought like this is a really like booming field where there must be lots of opportunities. I was just curious, given that we're talking about, you know, PhD students and postdocs, are there many positions out there? And if so, do you know how to find them? Or is it actually still like a very small field? It is a very small field. There are not a lot of job opportunities. There are especially not a lot of job opportunities after the postdoc stage. So that's something, you know, I'm facing right now, um, is that having done several postdocs in meta research, I'm now looking at, oh, there aren't any faculty positions in meta research. So where do you go? So if you do want to do a postdoc in meta research, I think you need to, you know, bear that in mind. If anyone's like generally interested in uh, yeah careers in meta research, then there's there's a couple of panel discussions uh, which you can probably find on YouTube by uh, Amos, the Association for Interdisciplinary Meta Research and Open Science, and I was on one of those panel discussions. Um, so you'll get to hear from people who aren't me as well, which is definitely a good thing. Um, and uh, hear all these different perspectives on careers in meta research. So that's a really good place to check out. In terms of just finding individual opportunities, um, I don't know of any kind of central place for that. Um, I often hear about them on social media, uh, Twitter or Blue Sky. And if I see them, I usually retweet them. So you can uh, probably find some in my feed. I think Metrics is actually currently advertising a postdoc fellowship, which would have been the same thing I did many years ago. Um, although the deadline is very soon. So <laughs> maybe maybe possibly after the podcast comes, we need to rush this podcast out so people can hear about it. Um, but that's that they normally come out once a year. So keep your eye out for those. Um yeah, I think it's it's a great thing to do. It's such an exciting area. It's important to be aware of how limited the opportunities are. And there are various, you know, strategies you can adopt. Like you could try to keep doing some area in whatever, you know, other domain. So for me, for example, I probably should have kept doing a lot of research in, in memory as well as my meta research work. And then I would have had a much more uh, balanced CV, if you like, Um I think that's probably a good strategy to adopt at the moment if you're particularly, you know, concerned about having a job, which most people are, right? <laughs> so um, just something to be aware of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, then to my, my kind of standard question, uh, you know, any advice for, I don't know, maybe that was your advice, but uh, any advice for PhD students uh, or postdocs or people kind of at that transition? Yeah. So, I generally find it quite difficult to give advice without knowing, you know, the individual situation um, that I'm speaking to. But I did kind of reflect on this question and think what is one thing I've learned, you know, over that transition from PhD to postdoc that at least I've found useful and, you know, so people can take what they want from this. And that's the, you know, a, a big part of moving from being a PhD student to a postdoc is that there's this big emphasis on becoming more independent, right? Having said that, I think we all need advice and support 
throughout our careers and, and definitely still at that stage. There are so many unwritten rules of academia to learn about. And I think it just makes you a better scientist if you have good critical feedback on your work. But the more and more independent you become, the more difficult it can actually be to get those things. And to some extent, the more difficult it it feels to ask for other people for those things because you kind of think, oh, maybe I should probably know that already. Um, and I don't want to, you know, ask questions about this stuff. So my advice is to is that you know as you're making that transition to greater independence, perhaps ironically, you need to start becoming much more proactive about finding support because you can't just rely on your PhD supervisor anymore. And your postdoctoral advisor might be expecting you to be quite independent. So find other mentors that can give you advice, both you know career advice, but also feedback on your on your work, on your research, on your ideas. Build a network of people. Get many different perspectives because everyone has different experiences, and it's good to learn different things from different people. And also rethink mentorship a bit. So the traditional idea of mentorship is that it's top down and it's unidirectional so you ask someone more experienced than you to provide you with advice but actually there are you know i have some really good mentoring relationships where it's a two-way discussion and they're not necessarily more experienced than me it might be another postdoc who um, i exchange drafts of papers with and you know they don't even work in my area maybe but they they can provide advice on the the quality of the writing etc and also from students. So the traditional idea is that, you know, if you're a postdoc, you would be mentoring students, but students can mentor you as well. Um, if you, you know, <laughs> listen to them and think about, uh, you know, how they are experiencing your uh, supervision or um, the quality of your writing, your ideas, etc., you can have um, really good discussions with them as well. So think about mentorship in a kind of multi-directional way and seek out those people who will provide you honest critical feedback on your work because the more you become formally more independent in your career, I think the more difficult it is for that kind of thing to happen spontaneously. So you have to be proactive about it. That's my advice. Okay, well, uh, I think that that's all for me unless you have anything else you want to add. Uh, I'll just say thank you very much. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks so much.